What isn't reality? What isn't life? Can you find anything that isn't life, that isn't reality? Of course, there's only reality. And even if there are parts, those parts are made of reality. There are no parts because it's like the flame and the fire metaphor. The flames aren't a part. They're not separate. They are the fire. And this is the essence of spirituality. Fundamentally, we are asking what is true? What is the nature of life, of myself, of the world, of these objects? They are manifestations of the unmanifest reality. That sounds like a paradox. It sounds like a contradiction. How can the unmanifest manifest this way? There's no way to explain it. It is inexplicable. It is impossible. It is incredible. It is miraculous. Yet there is this presentation. There is this revelation. There is this expression of reality. Everywhere you go, whatever you do, however you feel, there is only that. And you are that. So you can't leave yourself. You can't get out of yourself. And you're experiencing, sometimes, the human experience, the ego experience, the separateness experience. Sometimes feeling lost, sometimes getting stuck, sometimes forgetting what you actually are, having had glimpses and then seemingly being pulled back into this human experience. But it's an experience. When you recognize that it is an experience and the experience is made of this experiencing fact we could also call it awareness, then it's inconsequential how that is expressed, how you express yourself. So it isn't about attaining certain states or powers. You could say that they are sort of clarifying experiences which help you recognize truth. If you're listening to this, it's because you are interested in truth, not acquiring more ideas about what is true, but truth itself. Because this is a recognition, this is a reclamation, a re-knowing of what truly is. All there is, is that one truth. And the experiential recognition of that is what we could call enlightenment. Fleeting falsity always eventually burns in the permanent fire of the enlightening power of reality. The system is set up for enlightenment, really. Life, reality is set up for enlightenment because... Enlightenment is what it is, and eventually it can't not see itself forever. It can't not recognize itself. There's only one substance to absolutely everything, and it can't be other. It's the one outpouring of source, you could say. This is the absolute presenting itself to itself. It always is itself. But then the fact that that can present differently from itself that bubbling over of love and the bubbling over of, of ecstasy and joy and just completeness within itself into this manifest experience that appears always different from itself it presents as absolutely everything possible and imaginable and beyond everything imaginable that's ridiculous reality god infinity is presenting itself to itself as your life as all of this it sounds like these kind of abstract kind of philosophical notions but it's not it's it's really not it's a really simple thing to see when you see it and i don't want to advertise it as oh when you see it when you're lucky enough to have some seeing you know it's like no it's it's actually what you are already it's not that some people are have won some spiritual lottery and they're seeing it and you're not seeing it it's just like some people have noticed that they're not a person (laughs) and that they are what you are and they've noticed the actual state of affairs which is like reality is exploring various ways of exploring itself various apparent paths various like interesting little journeys it takes itself on when it already is really always at the finish line it's always at the end of the journey so from the end of the journey the enjoyment is the journey like you're already finished you already got to where you need to go that's the starting point so seeing through what appears to be going on the superficial level of things you're seeing through all of this suffering and pain and what have you that you've got yourself tangled up in temporarily tangled up in and it's only ever made of that whatever that substance is you know it's it's always a case of even this this experience that you're having right now however it's appearing 
can't ever be other than the one fact of reality. You're listening to the Non-Duality Podcast. This is Nick Hyam from nisagayoga.com and here with me is Paul Dobson. What this is, is this singular reality. When you look from the standpoint of being someone who is outside of that or who needs to work towards attaining that, it's amazing. It's an amazing prospect. But one day I'll find oneness, I'll become one. When you realise you are that, then it's kind of amazing that you can <laughs> kid yourself into believing that you're something else. There's no problem experiencing yourself as something else. That seems to be what's going on here. That seems to be the, the play. That seems to be the game to forget. For what purpose? In order to remember. <laughs> this mode you're in, you could call it forgetfulness. And it's the medium through which, by which, in which you remember. And it's inevitable. So all is well. Yeah, that's totally. You want something at stake in a way. I think you as Vaz want something at stake. I want this to be gripping. I want this to be interesting. Like, what do I do with eternity? What do I do with infinity? My own infinity, my own eternity. <laughs> Let's play games. How far can I push the boat out? How much can I forget myself? So this is why there's no hierarchy in the spiritual world because the forgetting is part of the remembering. It's part of the same boomerang boomeranged curve you know <laughs> it's this, it's all one curve there's no better part of the curve it's just different points to be in it at any one time and there is no time so it doesn't really matter where you are it all reconciles as Ra says in the law of one I can't remember the exact quote but it's you are enjoying this dance basically you dance in somewhat eccentric patterns yet through your dance of time and space all will be reconciled at, at some point because it can't not be, as Colette said in, in uh, the previous chat you guys had, you can't ignore it forever. You can't not notice it forever. So in that sense, it's, it's like, okay, that's my starting point. Relax a bit. Now now here you are. I w I'd like to know myself again. I'd like to recognize myself again. Let's explore it. Let's enjoy it. Let's have fun exploring it. Like that is coming from that place where you know all is well. You can't. You can't be lost forever you can't, because you can't. There's no possibility of being lost, really. You can't not recognize yourself forever. It's what you are. <laughs> it's like you're not recognizing your hand or something. It's like eventually, oh, this is my hand. Of course it is. You know, it's eventually you're going to notice that that's your hand. <laughs> that's the simplicity to which you notice your experience and the inseparability of yourself your experience and everything you perceive is all one continuum, one flow of what you are. It's, it's, you can't, it's the same as not noticing your hand over and over again, every moment going, I feel this thing and I haven't quite connected the dots yet. There's this thing in my experience and I'm, uh, I don't know what it is, but I'm pretty sure I, I kind of know it maybe. And then you're like, oh yeah, it's my hand. I know it's a really kind of simple and slightly silly analogy, but it's really like that because your body actually is experience. As we said before, your body is experience. Your body isn't just this human body, it's experience. And so everything you perceive, everything you ever perceive in any way whatsoever is part of that body, totally inseparable. And your perception, it includes everything. Mm. <laughs> you know, you, you're anything, it's not limited, it's unlimited. So basically you are aware of, as your body, you are everything all at once because you are, are totally unlimited. And it's so, so, so connected that it goes beyond the intimacy of even your own human body and all of its parts. It's so connected. It's prior to that. You're closer to that than even your human body in a way because it's the human body is is an experience. It's it's within that. You are the, the immediacy, the you're like, boom, you're here already. And then the human body appears within that. But you're already here. The body then appears. And everything else is appearing in the same way that the human body appears. And so you're already there. And if you can catch that instantaneousness, 
that in the instant of you perceiving anything, there's no separation. There's no, there's never actually any separation, but in the instant, it's known. You already know it. It's like you already know it. It's then you just trip over that and go, oh, I don't know this. I need to get the oneness out of this. It's already there. The oneness is there. In the instant anything appears, the oneness is there. You just have believed the the segue that you take off into your concepts about what things are, your ideas, your formulations about separation. <laughs> and then you believed it from there. But you're totally there. It's not even like you're perceiving something. You're not perceiving oneness. You are. You're already there. And then you've imagined that you're not. It's like, when does that imagination come in? Is that, that's got to be after the instant. That's got to be after the immediate noticing of the fact. But then there's another level to it where you, because everything is that, the mind, of course, is that as well. And it's just, and the more sensitive you can be with your experience, the more you can notice even that. So therefore, there's nothing that can't arise which isn't already totally that and totally noticed as that mm. you know the metaphor that comes to mind is you look through a pair of glasses and most of the time you're ignorant of the fact that you are looking through glasses because those glasses don't have any discernible characteristics the glasses are clear mm. so you're overlooking them you're ignoring you're ignorant of the fact you're looking through the glasses. Yet, you are always looking through the glasses. So are you really ignoring them? Because you can't not see them. When you're really sensitive, you, you can start to shift your focus somehow, tune into the glasses. So yeah, in one sense, you are ignoring enlightenment. You're ignoring reality, the way things are, the truth of life. In a more ultimate sense, one, you can't avoid it because life reality is the enlightening, enlivening fact that creates experience, that experience is made of. And two, you are that. You can't avoid yourself. You are that one self. You are that reality. As Ramana said, enlightenment is only being rid of the notion that one is not enlightened or you could say one is not enlightenment, this enlightening fact of being, of being blossoming, of the unmanifest showing itself in symbolic, apparently fragmented ways. Like this is the fractal depiction of that reality that you are, like this patterning. When you look at it, it all seems very fixed and very consistent and very ordered. When you look at your experience, like, yep, yeah, that's a lamp. Okay, that's a lamp. No big deal. <laughs> why investigate further? I mean, why would I? It's just a lamp. Okay. And this is a chair. This is a ceiling. This is a clock. Okay. This is a body. Yeah, fine. All very ordered, all very real. And then when you look closer, I mean, experientially, I don't mean through a a microscope as such, although that's revealing in its own right, but not something I can talk about. When you look closer and you feel closer and more sensitively, when you actually engage with it experientially, empirically, you don't find a lamp. When you feel the sensation of this form, only feel it. You don't feel a lamp. You don't find a lamp in that feeling. Just as when you put your hand in water, that sensation is not wet. <laughs> you don't find water in the sensation. So where's the water? You know, the, the, the visual representation of the water is not wet. There's no water in the visual seeing. What are the senses representing? Well, the senses aren't representing anything. There are no sense organs representing anything external. That's a belief, totally conceptual. It's a good enough model, but what's actually true about your experience? That is the question. There's only sensing and the various modes of sensing, hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, and so on. They're just arbitrary words 
distinctions applied to the one sense, which is nameless, is, is indescribable, we could give it many words. Just for the purpose of clarity in this conversation, we could call it experiencing. And that's not a belief. You are experiencing. That's undeniable. What that experiencing is, how that experiencing happens, can you really say? No, you can't. Not if you really consider it. So this experiencing fact enlightens, like it illuminates all of these experiences. And the experiences are not outside of it, not cut off from it, does not represent the experiences. The experiences are seamlessly at one with this unlimited and timeless experiencing. You must be that because your self-concepts change, but the experiencing itself remains the same always, just, just always constantly itself never changes, permanent, consistent, always the same, despite the complexity of experiences. This enlightening fact of experiencing. So this is enlightenment. Yeah. This is only about seeing through the idea that you are not that enlightening experiencing. It's not an accomplishment. It's ordinary, simple, and it's just what you are. It's nothing to arrive at and attain. There's no work to do to get to it. The work creates the conditions or the clarity, the lucidity to recognize this. So the purpose is not just to stay on clarity, but to use that clarity to cleanse the lens of seeing. Another way to say it is enlightenment is the absence of resistance to what is, like this total intimacy with whatever is unfolding, whatever is being expressed as these various experiences. But let me just qualify that by saying it's not about you not resisting as a separate person. <laughs> it's recognizing that this is non-resistance. This like this is non-resistance. This is the unconditional yes. It's already like that. This is already allowance. This is an unconditional embrace, an unqualified love that accepts it all, that, that doesn't it even accept it, but that gives birth to it all. Again, it's noticing that non-resistance, not trying to stop resisting, because that in itself is resistance. It's just kind of getting online experientially with what already is the case. And you could call that enlightenment, but you don't need to. But like you said, this enlightening, experiencing fact, we could call it also reality is set up for enlightenment simply because everywhere you look everywhere you go there's only that mm. yeah so you can't avoid it you can't ignore it you can't escape it it's not about trying to find it you can't escape it to begin with so start from there start from the fact start from the fact that you are experiencing and this experiencing is this essence that is the ground the actual context from which, out of which, all these experiences are created or manifested. I mean, it can seem like reconciliation. It can seem like becoming enlightened, remembering. It can certainly seem that way. But this is already reconciled. This is already itself. And you are that. Yeah, I, I find it um, quite a good pointer, just in regards to what you just said. To notice that this is already you're already switched on. <laughs> you know, it's one we keep coming back to, but you're already totally switched on. So you're already awake and aware. You can't turn it off. Notice, notice that you're already totally switched on. You're already totally aware and you are choicelessly aware. Like you don't choose whether to be aware or not. It just is. That's the fact. That's all the fact that we're ever talking about is actually that fact. Because that fact is what is so you're already aware and in within that that is non-resistance because um you notice that and the noticing of that is is relaxation actually because the tenseness the tightness the seeming resistance is either trying to get to that fact or trying to get somewhere 
or trying to even get away from that fact, perhaps. It's always trying to get something. But if you notice that you're already totally switched on and there's nothing you could possibly do about it, there's nothing you can do or can't do, it's actually an irrelevant point. You just, it's there. It's what you are. You could just turn your efforting, if there was a sort of a dial of turning your efforting down, you could turn your efforting down to 0% and you are totally here. You don't need to try and stop effort. You don't need to try and make effort. You just are here. You're switched on. That's the fact. To me, that's relaxation, which is synonymous with the fact for me. <laughs> it's the noticing of the already existing relaxation. This is like, you know, it's something I've explored a lot because I do these lie, lying down kind of, I guess you could call them non-meditations or meditations, whatever word you want to use for them. And at first, you know, you I approached it in various levels of, I guess you could call it maturity over the years. At start with, I would try and surrender, try and relax. And that maybe was an appropriate mode at the time. Maybe that was helpful in some way because it led me to a point where I realized the true relaxation is just happening by itself. It's just there. It's kind of the more I try and do these things, the more I'm actually not relaxing. <laughs> Um, but it's, it almost takes a bit of, in my experience, takes a bit of, um, trial and error, seeing what works kind of, is there something to this? What? And then following that and then going, okay, is there something to this? And eventually, you know, there's less and less <laughs> of any trying. You just forget that you were ever even meditating. You forget that meditation's even a thing. It's just like, oh, here I am. It's the simplest thing. All of the tensions are naturally released by themselves. There's no efforting to surrender. It just is. And the reason I'm, I'm mentioning this is obviously you can give that a try yourself. It's something that's worked for me, but it's always here. Total relaxation is, is always here, is what this is. This is total relaxation. And in what sense are you believing yourself to be resisting that or what ideas are making you feel like the need to even resist? You know, it's like, it's where it gets practical and helpful, not just in a non-dual sense, but in um, your everyday life, your an, an emotional sense, a psychological sense, you might have a thought that comes up. It might remind you of something painful in the past or something you're anxious about in the future or something someone did to you or whatever. And you can notice where that causes tightness, where there's resistance to it. Automatically, there's automatically a resistance to it. And this seems to go totally under the radar of this resistance. And you can feel it in the body. It might be like a, a tension in your stomach or your chest or your shoulders. And it's really interesting to watch that and just going, am I constricting here? Am I tightening here? And really what this is, is just a resistance to an idea. This is a, a knee-jerk reaction to an idea about something that may or may not have happened or may happen <laughs> or may not happen, you know, just an idea of an imagination of something in the past or future. You notice that if you just stay with the noticing that you're just here and aware and that's already the case and you just allow that restricted tenseness to just relax. You are allowing that energy to move and you're allowing life to just flow as it is completely naturally. And it's, there's a, there's a kind of integration and noticing that you don't need to ever be afraid that this is always relaxation. This always is safe. This always is home and it's it's totally allowed it's all, all allowed to be there that is the state of affairs when you don't go via your ideas of things or the the resistance only occurs within your ideas of what's happening or what has happened or what will happen the resistance only occurs in your imaginations of what has and will happen what this is as it is when not oriented to from that way in that way is just total relaxation that's what it is it it can't not be there's also as we always said there's always another level to it as well 
this is just kind of almost you kind of start looking at it like that and then you can uh, maybe as you build some kind of skillfulness you could say d- doing this you could notice that even those knee-jerk reactions to your thoughts and fears that, that causes the constriction and tightening in your body even those and even that whole process is relaxation <laughs> as a, a real s- subtle thing yeah because there's only one substance to things and one substance can only ever be itself it can appear otherwise if believed to be otherwise but it, it was always actually only itself it's you so you know that old pointer snake and the rope these tightnesses this constriction this knotting when a thought is fought and then then go to that thought and believe in it that's the snake you could say and then you notice that it was always a rope and it relaxes naturally it was always a rope it was never a thought it was never a snake but your body then naturally relaxes it's totally in flow with reality. It's not, there's no resistance. There's no, there's no going to an idea about what reality is. It's just totally. And then the body as a side effect, the body is like totally relaxed because it's that thing that you were thinking is, is no longer seen as a problem. It's no, the fear has been seen through. There's nothing to fear. It's only ever ideas that cause these little tensions in the bodies. Um, and, uh, when you're seeing that the ideas aren't true, that there's only ever this this one fact, and this one fact is always inherently relaxed, inherently free, inherently loose, just limitless, and it's all that it takes is, is that noticing, and it's it's there. Uh, when you allow that to just not be constricted, and just allow that energy, just totally engage with that energy energy on a totally pr- sort of primary level, and just willing to face that energy. Mm-hmm you see that the snake <laughs> is a rope, <laughs> so to speak. It's God seeing God. It's going, there's actually nothing to fear here. The body then relaxes and it's kind of like this, in, in relatively speaking, it's like there's a, an integration that takes place. That fear is integrated into, or it's reclaimed as truth. You're no longer believing in the falsity. The ignorance is dissolved and there's an energetic level to that where it's, the energy can flow then and it's like ah it's being directly with your experience as always and if you're directly with like razor sharp directly with like right in the instant of anything arising directly with not veering off into concepts and not and your interpretations just directly with what is it's can't not be integrated it can't not be seen as what it is it cannot you know it's totally um perceived accurately yeah exactly in believing that certain things certain experiences are not this oneness of experiencing reality of course you're going to resist of course you're going to fear of course you're going to believe in this notion of lack and therefore desire certain states that are more in alignment with truth apparently but in recognizing there is any truth, then more and more there's only that knowing of truth. Mm. So seeing is not believing. Seeing is revealing. You've acquired enough beliefs. If you're listening to this, it's because you are more interested in the revelation of truth, not acquiring more ideas about what is true, but truth itself. Because this is a recognition, like you said, this is a reclamation, a re-knowing of what truly is. All there is, is that one truth, that one reality, that one life that you are. And the recognition of that, the experiential recognition of that, and therefore the reclamation, the re-knowing of that fact, is what we could call enlightenment. But even then, what often happens is a process of integration a realignment of what you've taken yourself to be the body the mind and your experience of the world with this recognition this understanding and that can also seem like a relaxing or relaxing into that truth and questioning how am i 
resisting this truth? How am I still believing? Am I still going back into beliefs? How am I still believing that certain things are not that? Where there are areas of your life that don't seem like truth, then the invitation is to question that notion and see how you're resisting that and realign with sensitivity and with clear seeing with the fact that there is only that truth. Yeah. One of my favorite Zen sayings is this, before one studies Zen, mountains are mountains and waters are waters. After a first glimpse into the truth of Zen, mountains are no longer mountains and waters are no longer waters. After enlightenment, after this seeing, this seeing of the obvious, mountains are once again mountains and waters are once again waters. You don't have to try not to see mountains and waters, which just represents your experience. The question is, what is it really? When you recognize that what you know is only that, then there's this exploration and celebration of how that one fact can present, can express itself. So there's no resistance there. There's no need to change any of what is being expressed because you discern the nature of it. The play of experiences are just ever changeful, so it's always in a state of fluidity anyway. That will happen. You don't have to micromanage your experience. It's like this inherent trust, this existential trust in in yourself ultimately, which is reality. Uh, this deeper knowing that there's only that. Zenji said, Enlightenment is intimacy with all things. Of course, it's this intimacy beyond intimacy, immediacy beyond immediacy, because all things are that are you. And another quote here by Zen master Lin Chi. If you love the sacred and despise the ordinary, you are still bobbing in the ocean of delusion. Even that mode of delusion is... You know, it happens within and it is known through just complete switched onness. <laughs> yeah. You know what it's like? What came to me is um, it's quite a funny example, but someone being in a queue for a card machine and the person at the front of a queue, you know, goes to use it. It doesn't work. Obviously, it doesn't work. They turn around to the next person and say, you know, it doesn't work. Wouldn't bother. It will eat your card. And they go, fuck it, I'll do it anyway. (laughs) And this is basically my experience, at least my experience, and I'm guessing many others' experience, of sages, pointers throughout the many years, you know, these absolute crystal clear pointers go, you know, there's nothing to do. Reality is already complete, already here, totally here. There's You're already exactly what you are. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to have any special experiences. You don't need to um work on yourself any of this stuff it's already totally here and i'd hear that and go yeah great and then i'd chase experiences via psychedelic drug trips (laughs) and all kinds of yoga and meditation and i think there's a wisdom to that in a weird way Mm -hmm. i think it's like because reality literally is experience it's experiential you literally have to have the experience of that failing before you really believe it. You can't just take someone's word for it and go, well, they say it's all here, but I don't, I can't feel that now. So I'm going to try the desire stuff. Fuck it. Try it all. Like, no, because you have to go through it in a sense, in my experience, uh, to go, that didn't work. Or there was something revealed, but I I can see that uh, I was mistaking the as Peter Brown would call it, the diving board for the pool. <laughs> I was I was collecting diving boards instead of jumping off the diving board into the pool. <laughs> but you might, you know, it might take you many jumps or many standing on the edge of the diving board or whatever to finally jump into the pool. But mm. when you're seeing clearly delusion is is seen as just another another perfect part of reality and it's just not not even a part, it's just an absolutely crystal clear expression of truth it is so there's 
there's various ways you can go with that. Like, you know, you can see if you can notice the crystal clarity in delusion, if you can see delusion for what it truly is, do it. <laughs> Don't waste your time with all the other stuff. Do it. If you can't do it, try the other stuff. Like reality is exploring various ways of exploring itself, various apparent paths, various like interesting little journeys yeah. it takes itself on when it already is really always at the finish line. It's always at the end of a journey. So from the end of a journey, the enjoyment is the journey. Like you're already finished. You already got to where you need to go. That's the starting point. So explore the feelings and the, and the qualities of being in delusion. So how does it feel? Like really feel into it. Be honest with yourself. As Colette said, a really good point in the previous episode. Be totally honest with yourself. How does it feel to be in delusion going, I feel fucking hopeless and I can't get there. I can't see it. These guys keep saying this stuff and I can't see it. I don't care what they say. I really just, I'm just, whether I try or not try, I stop. I try and see it. I try and notice my experience. I can't do it. And you go, okay, just be honest with yourself. That's exactly where I am. And it it relieves the tension around it because actually within that honesty, you, you're there. I mean, the honesty, the honesty reveals where you already are actually because the tension is relieved from needing to be somewhere other than you are. It's really, really subtle. Have compassion with yourself because it's so fucking subtle. Like it's for so frustratingly subtle, but it's okay like that's that overused phrase it's okay not to be not okay you know but it kind of is like that you see and there's the tension is released and it's like that that old that old analogy they, they use in zen i think where they sort of you stir the water like say you've got mud in a glass and you stir it all up it's all just going to be muddy muddy water but then if you just let it settle it just the water the, the mud goes to the bottom in the crystal clear water is there you just got to let it settle just go fine that's where i am and even this this is an exploration of reality reality wants this reality wants this experience it wants to know what that's like so it's having that experience that you're having what does that feel like what are the qualities of that really feel it like directly feel it on an energetic level what how does that feel exactly so whatever state you find yourself in investigate what that state is made of recognize that that state has a name like call it stuckness identify the meanings associated with that word with that narrative stuckness reverse engineer that state dismantle it not to get rid of it but to discern its truth to recognize its nature what's the nature of stuckness is it stuckness or is it something else because if it's not stuckness, then you're not stuck, are you? <laughs> <laughs> what is the nature of this? Delve beneath the narrative and just consider the, the various building blocks. So that stuckness experience is located in the pit of your stomach and, and it just feels contracted and tight and heavy. It's like a black hole that's, that's pulling you in. And there's a coldness there and there are memories there. What you're doing now is you're going beneath the narrative into how that stuckness experience is encoded in your experience. How the various ingredients come together to create this. And then, like I said earlier, you, you don't find water in the sensation of water. So feel the very sensation of stuckness. And is there stuckness in that sensation without the narrative, without the, the meaning making mode of perceiving this thing? Do you find stuckness? Do you find stuckness in the, the blackness of that black hole? If you just see it as an image, just an image, just an image, like you were looking at a piece of artwork or a photograph of a black hole in space, you don't see stuckness there. It's not personal. And more and more, you reach this place of neutrality, of just sensation level experiencing of this. You're out of it. I don't mean that you're 
bypassing it. I'm not saying that you're running away from it. I mean, you're absolutely tuning into it. You're really considering it. Like you're really with it. You're being sensitive to it. You're intimate with it. But at the same time, it can't define you. It's an experience you are having presently and you're not wrapped up in it. You recognize that. You're not embroiled in this and you are that capacity of experiencing. That's what you recognize and, and that you, that this cake of stuckness is actually made of you. Like all of the ingredients that it, that it consists of, all of those ingredients are made of you. So if you see the stuckness, if you see whatever it is, then that is the unstuckness. Yes, well put. So just to change metaphors, the metaphor you used of letting the muddy water settle, let it settle. And you let it settle by getting out of your head into your body. By that, I mean feeling rather than thinking. The thinking kind goes on. You know, it will. It will go on. Don't try to stop thinking. Just consider what, what else is here to experience beyond that mode of thinking. Go into feeling. Go into sensing. And you will find a sort of neutrality there, a purity there, a sameness there, a oneness. There's only this sensing. There's only this experiencing, this subjectivity that everything is made of. Then any state can happen. You can experience anything, but again, you, you recognize what it's made of. Then those things you're aware of, those experiences, as a kind of byproduct of this investigation, they do shift, they do soften, they do relax. There is a lightness to them. It's not a new experience that means something about you. And that's another really subtle point. We're not reaching a point where your experience is transformed and therefore you are transformed into something better. It's not about states, it's about the nature of those states. And like you said earlier, reality wants this experience you are experiencing right now. Like go back to the beginning of this conversation, all is experiencing, all is reality, everything is that. So whatever experience you're having can only be reality, you can only be born of reality, made of reality, uh, a depiction, a representation of reality. So in that sense, that is what's here. You, like you don't even have to allow it. You don't even have to do anything with it. Like that's what's here. So there's there can be an experiential alignment with the facticity of this present moment experience, however it is, and the true nature of that. So reality does seem to want to have this <laughs> because it's happening, but only because of that. Maybe some higher reason, I don't know. But in my direct observation or my direct um, noticing, it, it is just what is. But how it seems on the surface is not what it is when you do that investigation, when you peel back the layers of conditioning into the essential makeup of what's here. Yeah, seeing through what appears to be going on the superficial level of things. You're seeing through all of this suffering and pain and what have you, that you've got yourself tangled up in temporarily, tangled up in. And it's only ever made of that, whatever that substance is. And so reality must on some level want this experience. You know, it's it's always a case of even this, this experience that you're having right now, however, however it's appearing, is unbelievably precious. Mentally, you kind of... Re- you imagine yourself rejecting it, don't you? So invite it fully in, embrace it, you could say. Embrace it because it's already there. It's already being embraced. So just notice that you're embracing it and allow yourself to fully fully be with it on every level, you know. But I mean, really like knowingly embrace the experience. If you sort of, there's a quality to it where you knowingly embrace it. It's like when you note it obviously reality has a situation where it's always the case that reality is what it is but then noticing that reality is what it is it's a kind of quality it can't really be put into words but there's something to it where it's enjoying what it is it's fully appre- appreciating what it is <laughs> knowingly you know not blindly it's like um like a lucid dream you're not you're not fully able to appreciate the dream if you're not lucid uh, in a lucid in a dream. You just kind of like you're kind of just well, you're just wandering around. Everything seems to be happening to you, and it's just like what are these weird situations? Nothing makes any sense, but it's 
Um, and then you become lucid in the dream and you're like, I fully appreciate every single little bit of what's going on here. <laughs> it's a totally different experience, yet, yet arguably it's the same because it's all just dream. Yet the quality of it is different. Yeah. You were dreaming, whether you were lucid or not, you were dreaming. So that means everything you were experiencing was made of dream. And you are the dreamer. Like you are the one dreamer. There aren't any other dreamers unless you were dreaming about other dreamers. Like you could have that dream too. Yeah. You are the one dreamer. And so everything is made of you. Everything is made of your dreaming capacity. So whether you're lucid or not, there's dream. And that's just the way it is. Then you can become lucid in that dream, which just means that you're dreaming knowingly or conscious dreaming. It's all awareness because awareness is needed to dream. So it's not quite even right to say there's a new awareness <laughs> that gives you that, that ability to, to dream lucidly. But anyway, there is this lucidity. So the dreaming was always there. You were the one dreamer, whether you know it or not, whether you're lucid or not. And then there's also the kind of the waking up within the dream. And so it's a bit like that, that even if you are ignorant, seemingly, of truth, of reality, the way things are, things are already the way they are. This is already a reality. And then within because where else would there be within reality and who else would there be because there's only reality as reality within reality there's a lucidity of the existing fact of this enlightening experiential reality so that's what it all comes down to really and while you're not lucid while you're not conscious of this then yes that has been called a state of ignorance it has been called delusion but when you realise that there's only the dreaming capacity, there's only the one dreamer, there's only the one reality, and you're actually having a dream of ignorance, a dream, or, or that you're experiencing this uh, this thing, this state of delusion, then that state of delusion is made of reality. So it's not really ignorance. It's not really delusion. It just seems like that, and it's hard to recognise what we're talking about while you are focusing on that alone while you're fixated excessively on that particular manifestation of the dream of reality. And reality wants this experience and you are that. Because if it's happening, that's what's being manifested. That's what's being experienced. I mean, let's just keep it simple. So who are you to argue with yourself? <laughs> well, you are yourself. So what's the point arguing? There's only a need for arguing and resisting and not relaxing when you are convinced by the present show. And, you know, I keep thinking of the movie Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Yeah, it's a good film. Amazing film. So if you haven't seen it, the, the basic plot is that the two main characters, Joel and Clementine, are initially in a relationship. One of them, Clementine, undergoes this medical procedure to have her memories of Joel erased. Joel rec realizes this, so then Joel then has the same procedure. However, even though his memories have been erased, he just can't forget Clementine. He just can't get her out of his head. And he's compelled to remember her and eventually well i don't want to spoil it for you but basically by the end of the movie having been gravitationally pulled back to one another they recognize that you know even though things don't seem perfect in their relationship it's still worthwhile that's the plot that's going on now reality has chosen whatever you're experiencing and you know you've kind of purposely forgotten and now you're being compelled to return to truth it's like mountains are mountains, waters are waters, but they're seen in a new light, in a new way. That's really what we're talking about. It's making peace with what is, you know, befriending what is. Also, another movie that you introduced me to, which I'm glad I watched. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Oh, yeah. Evelyn 
she doesn't have a perfect life in terms of her narrative through her exploration of other universes that all are kind of intermingled suddenly and therefore the different lives she could have led and the different experiences she could have had, different definitions of herself and self-concepts she could have enjoyed, she realises that this is the life I want. And there's a lot of films like that, aren't there, where you kind of like yeah. The Wizard of Oz, <laughs> Dorothy, having had that amazing journey going to Oz, it's fantastical and wondrous and wow amazing and then she returns home and she says if i ever go looking for my heart's desire again i'll i won't go any further than my own backyard because if it's not there then it's nowhere mm. and all of these movies and stories point to this it's like the hero's journey yeah it's like the coding of reality has coded itself into these little stories these uh these films and things isn't it it's just like little little breadcrumbs but yeah, no, I, I especially um, Everything Everywhere at Once, I love that one. I would highly recommend anyone listening watch that film. It's one of my favourite films I think I've ever seen now. Yeah, there's a lot to be said. Uh, this isn't a spoiler, really. It's just said there's a point where someone says to, to Evelyn, every disappointment you've ever had, every every failure, every heartbreak, everything has led you to this perfect moment. That's true. Like, you know, there's no... In, in the sense that we're speaking, there's no, there's nothing wasted that is always leading you to this perfect moment in a way as well. There's nothing wasted. Like all of it is, as Ram Dass would say, grist for the mill. <laughs> because it's, it's just, there's such wisdom in these things. And we would, ch- if we got the chance, we would choose as people to not go through any of them. And there would be no depth to us whatsoever. It's like a, a fierce wisdom that reality kind of burns into itself through these these painful experiences because they're so rich. They're so rich. And I mean, the opportunity to be with them as they're happening is a, to really appreciate and knowingly be there with that particular experience as it's unfolding is so much, so much richness to that and so, so much in words that I can't describe why it's beneficial it just is it's just like a deepening or something the words aren't really there because I don't know the full mechanics of reality but it's not all about you know always seeing the oneness you know I know this is literally non-duality podcast it's not all about seeing the oneness always you know sometimes it's about just being with your experience and there's no trying to see the oneness really it's kind of more like the other way around it's like the more you're sensitively with your experience and more in some way skillfully with your experience and, and exploring it and investigating it just openly without any wanting to get a conclusion, without looking for oneness of any kind, you know, just let's look at my experience. The more it kind of reveals itself as the oneness that was already there, you just kind of like, it's not, you don't need to think, oh, I'm seeing oneness now. True. <laughs> it just kind of reveals itself. Don't go in with any goal, maybe. Just be with whatever's occurring as closely as you can, as directly as you can. Um, Honouring whatever's occurring, just totally being with it, not running away from it, just just opening to whatever's occurring. And it reveals more and more and more. And it's kind of like a revealing that it's not a revealing that it's a thinking, oh, I've got this new idea or this new information that's come in. It's more, it just becomes more and more obvious it's obvious it's like an obviousness absolutely beautifully put don't worry about oneness because if you are concerned with attaining oneness then of course you're coming from the position of being separate otherwise why would you need to attain it i mean you are you are being called to the recognition anyway that's happening so trust that process of coming home yes trust the process you are the hero there are no villains and if there are any villains then they are here to support you in your journey and this journey is not a linear a to z path it is this moment this journey is happening now only so you're on the hero's journey then along the way you forget that you are here now you forget that you're a hero that everything is happening for the purpose of self-realization 
and also that this moment that the the very substratum out of which from which this experience of the journey stems is self and so what is happening what is growing and blossoming in your present experience is self but it's doing so to show you yourself to show yourself to yourself this moment right now is the process of self-realization so you are having this adventure which sometimes feels like a misadventure but that's part of the adventure you're moving from ignorance to knowledge so knowledge is not intellectual it's like the knowledge is the beingness that is the only knowledge that's this yana that advaita talks about it's this very being that you feel already that you feel now that this very existence that you've always known no matter where you are on your journey you've always felt that you are even if you haven't recognized what you are even if you've assumed that this beingness is a product of a body or a mind well despite all of that you know that you are and that is knowledge so f- follow that knowledge but it's not something you can attain it's not something that it's not a prize it's more like the victory is the recognition of your beingness the recognition of what you are and then with this knowledge that seems like newfound knowledge you then return home mountains are mountains rivers are rivers or waters are waters but you return home transformed you're not a new and improved person the transformation is is the discernment of the nature of the person and that the nature of all this is equal to the person or said another way that this beingness that you feel this knowledge this atman is identical with ultimate reality brahman as they say in advaita so yeah like you say just don't be concerned with the pursuit of oneness just work with what you have just ask what is this experience and what is it happening in what's the medium what's the substance what's the essence what's the space in which it is occurring what's it resting on and what's experiencing your experience uh, it's all those sorts of questions yeah good questions it's um not trying to get to that it's just working with what you have which is reality there is only that and you are that <laughs>